represented by President Bush, for sure, and definitely not by Prime Minister Tony Blair, who's following uh, along with his new dossier. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Brothers, sisters, friends, assalamu alaikum. Welcome. It gives me tremendous pleasure to be in New Zealand and to share my story with so many of you tonight. Now I can see a lot of non-Muslims in the room. Just relax, I'm not Islam's answer to Billy Graham. Um, I want to share the story with you so you can enjoy it, maybe understand a little bit more about Islam. The title of the story is From Kabul to Kaaba, but I want to take you back a few weeks before I entered Kabul. I want to take you back to September 11. I bet everyone in this room can remember exactly where they were, who they were with, what they were doing when they heard about September 11. The Muslims that I have spoken to who saw the horrific events unfold on television told me that at the moment of the second plane going into the Twin Towers and realizing it was a terrorist strike, their first reaction was, please God, don't let this be the work of Muslims. I was in my newsroom in Fleet Street in London when I noticed people gathering around the television sets that were there. And I shouted over to somebody at the Sunday Express and said, what's going on? And they said, oh, there's been a terrible accident. There's a plane crashed into one of the Twin Towers in New York. And there's something compelling, isn't there? about live news breaking and live pictures. And I went up and joined everybody else and watched the drama unfold. And then we saw the second plane going in. I've told you about the immediate reaction of Muslims. My immediate reaction was, this is a big, big story. It's bigger than the assassination of JFK, could even be bigger than man landing on the moon. I've got to get out to New York. My reaction was different to those of the Muslims, certainly. By the time I got to Heathrow Airport, the Twin Towers had imploded, the Pentagon had been hit, a plane had gone down in Pennsylvania, America was at war, it was under siege. Her airspace had been closed down, her borders had been sealed, and I physically couldn't get into the country, no matter which airline or which route I looked at, it was impossible. And so I hung round Heathrow in and out for the next four days. Finally, I got that ticket for the first flight out to New York. And as I was making my way to the departure lounge, my phone went and it was my boss, the news editor. He said, there's been a change of plans. We want you to go to Pakistan. I was furious. The contacts that I had been making were in New York. My clothes that I had packed were for New York. I'd never been to Pakistan. I probably needed injections. You know, what is this country? Why do you want to send me there? This is a Middle Eastern thing. Why don't I go to the Middle East? And he said, no, the story is going to unfold in, in Pakistan and neighboring Afghanistan. Within 12 hours, I arrived in Islamabad, dressed for New York, which went down very well, as you can imagine. And over the next few days, I started writing about people's hopes and fears for the impending war which was going to happen in neighboring Afghanistan, where the richest country in the world 
was going to bomb the poorest country in the world. By the end of the week, 3,000 journalists from around the world had joined me. They were in Peshawar, they were in Islamabad, and they were down in Quetta. Thousands of journalists from all over the world, from print, radio, TV, the internet, every form of communication you can imagine. I worked for a Sunday newspaper. I was the chief reporter of the Sunday Express. And I was trying to second guess what the news would be at the weekend. You get a chance to be more analytical. And I'm not a journalist who has ever been spoon-fed from governments. I don't trust them. And so I began to think that the best story was probably in Afghanistan from the ordinary people, the ordinary Afghan people. I wanted to know what their expectations and fears were, what life was like for them living under the Taliban. We'd read a lot of news. According to Bush and Blair, the Taliban was the most evil, brutal regime in the world. They subjugated and oppressed women. They killed them randomly. The tales that were coming out were terrible. I distinctly remember Tony Blair saying, these people are so evil, they won't even let their children fly kites. And so I decided, well, I need to find this out for myself. And I went to the Taliban embassy in Islamabad, and I tried three times to get a visa, and three times I was rejected. And so in the end, with my guides, I had got two or three guides who were helping me, I decided to sneak into Afghanistan. The idea was planted in my head by the BBC's chief correspondent, John Simpson, who had put on a burqa and put his toe into Afghanistan and said, hey, look, I've become invisible. And I thought, well, if the BBC's gargantuan correspondent can become invisible, then surely it will be easy for me. And so we devised a plan that we would be part of a wedding party. I would go in with two guides, one from the NWFP province in uh, Pakistan. The other one was born in Afghanistan. And we went in as a group. I put on the burqa, we drove through the Khyber Pass. That was another eye-opening experience. I imagined the Khyber Pass to be about 30 yards long. It was 33 miles long, winding dramatic mountainous roads, amazing scenery, traces of British imperialism everywhere. And then we went right down into a dust bowl known as Torkham and there was no man's land. We got out of the car and started to walk towards the Taliban checkpoint where some very scary looking men with great big beards and big black turbans and Kalashnikovs were sitting, waiting. Suddenly I could hear my heart thump, thump, thump in my ears and I'm beginning to think maybe this isn't such a good idea. I wanted to turn round and run away, but I'd gone beyond the point of no return. But it was as predicted. I had become invisible. I didn't even warrant a first look, never mind a second look, as we crossed the Taliban checkpoint. I think I was a cross on someone's ID papers. And we went across, we jumped into a taxi, and we headed for the first major city, which was Jalalabad. I was very tense, very excited. I was going to see firsthand what life was like in one of the major cities in Afghanistan, in this male-dominated regime where women were oppressed and subjugated, according to Bush and Blair. When we pulled up at the marketplace, I was really surprised.
because there, who was doing all the shopping? The men. You can't get Western men into supermarkets or to do the shopping. And there were all these men doing the shopping. I thought, well, this is a good sign. Of course, the reason for that was under the Taliban uh, regime, women were not allowed to talk to strange men. And strange men were any men other than a husband, a father, a brother, or a close male relative. So doing something as simple as buying a bag of sugar was virtually impossible unless you were related to the trader. There were women around. They were all wearing the burqa and they were in the company of their mahram or male companion escort. I sat on the edge of the marketplace and watched and there were lots of Taliban around and people seemed very excited and very happy. They didn't seem as though they were about to be bombed by the most powerful nation in the world. People seemed relaxed and I was quite surprised. Our party then went with provisions to a tiny village, not even the size of this hall. And we went into the village and there was lots of tears and laughter as one of their own had returned and he brought with him his cousin from the NWFP, his wife, his children. And then they said, well, who's that? pointing at me, and he told them, he told them in Pashto, I didn't understand the language, but I could tell from the reaction that they were not at all happy. Why on earth have you brought a Westerner into our midst at a time of war? That day, the Taliban spiritual leader, Mullah Omar, had just announced that anyone helping a Westerner would be executed. So naturally, they were angry, they were nervous, they were agitated. But within half an hour, the natural exuberance and hospitality and curiosity of the Afghan people overcame the villagers and they started talking to me. The first was a, a young girl in her 20s. And I said, what do you think about this impending war? And she said, I am so angry. I should be in a hospital by now, qualified as a doctor, ready to help my people, ready to save lives. People are going to be wounded in this war, and I could help and save them. And I said, so what is your problem? She said, my training was stopped a couple of years ago. The Taliban closed down the training center and sent all the instructors home. And here I am now, back home, rotting away in this village when I should be helping my people. And I felt very sorry for her and I could feel her frustration. Here was a young, ambitious girl and her life seemed to have been put in limbo. Just then, her elder brother came in and he, through the translator, started talking, and he also had been training to be a doctor at the very same medical school. And when it had closed down for financial reasons, he too had been sent home. So it wasn't just the girl who was been affected, her brother was as well. And as we were communicating with the help of the translator, an Afghan lady, walked in and she looked at me very carefully and she put her hands on her hips and she really looked me up and down. And then she said through the translator, have you any children? And I said, yes, I have a daughter. She said, just one. And I said, yes, just one. And she pushed me, very strong. I lost my balance and went the other way. And she said, you English and American women, you are all so pathetic. All you can ever have is one or two children. Me, I can have 15. And when you run out of your boy soldiers, I will be producing more. 
Don't think that Afghan women are shy, retiring creatures. And I thought, well, if this is what the women are like, what on earth are the men like? And I said, but aren't you afraid of America, of American soldiers? She said, dare one American soldier come into my village and I will get those pots and pans and I will fight him back myself. And I thought she probably would. <laughs> Then she said, look, I'm really sorry about this mishap. We're very sorry, but this mishap in New York, it has nothing to do with us. And she kept calling 9-11 a mishap. And I thought, you know, this is really provocative, this is so offensive, this is insulting, 6,000 plus people have died, that's what we thought at the time, and you're calling it a mishap? And then I realized that under the Taliban, televisions were banned. Nobody saw the dramatic images that we saw, which were played on our TVs every day, day in, day out, for more than two, three weeks, whipping up the anger and the hysteria and the fear, watching the towers being hit, the towers imploding. They didn't see any of that. They lived in single-story buildings. So trying to convey to them the full horror of someone trying to jump from the 101st floor rather than face the inferno inside was very, very difficult. And that is why the Afghan people referred to 9-11 as a mishap. But she said, we're very sad, but what has this got to do with us? Why do the Americans want to bomb us? We didn't do that. And her argument had some logic to it. As the afternoon progressed, I could tell that people were getting more and more nervous by my presence in the village, and we took some photographs after some persuasion, and then we left. We thought we'll head back early. But by the time we got back to Torquem, the gates had closed, these great big metal gates, and we couldn't get through. Apparently, Pakistan had sealed the border. They weren't letting anybody in or out. We stayed overnight, and the next morning, we went back to the area of Torquem. And again, the gates were closed. And I said to my guides, if I don't get back by a certain time, my news editor will raise the alarm, and there will be all sorts of panic. And one of the guides said, well, we can go through a smuggling route. And my eyes lit up at this. I thought, this is very exciting. This will give me something to write about and add to the humanitarian report that I will be doing. And I said, great, okay. And I imagined that we'd be going through narrow mountain passes and ducking from bush to bush. And it would be really exciting because the border with Afghanistan is about 1,400 kilometers long, and there are said to be about 300, 400 smuggling routes, so you can imagine how porous the border is. And so we went to this area called Dawa Barber, but there was nothing secretive about it. In fact, there was probably more people in Dawa Barber than there are in this room tonight. There were camel traders, there were donkey traders, there were people selling refreshments, people selling carpets. There were Afghan families with all their goods packed into handcarts heading towards Pakistan, unable to bear facing yet another war in their country, wanting to get to the safety of Pakistan. And there were lots of young men striding over from Pakistan, looking for Taliban recruiting officers because they wanted to sign up and fight with the Taliban against the great Satan, as they referred to America. By this time, the Afghan shoes I had been wearing were cutting into my feet and they were bleeding and sore. And I complained and one of my guides said, well, we're only 10 minutes away from the border, but we can go by donkey. And he said, can you ride a donkey? 
And I thought, can I ride a donkey? You know, I can ride a horse, I can jump with a horse. Look at these donkeys, they're smaller. They're the same shape and size, you know, same shape, you know, and they, they look more or less the same, but they're smaller, probably easier to control. Of course I can ride a donkey. And so we set off and did a deal with uh, this man. I never understood how we were hiring it, how he was going to get it back, but he was happy to part with the donkey. And I got on its back. Now, I don't know if it sensed that it had an infidel on its back or what, but it just bolted. And it tore through this area. And my feet were waving, my arms were waving, the wind caught the burqa that I was wearing and billowed the burqa, which made the creature even more frightened and it ran even faster. I was screaming, my arms like this, I must have looked like a giant bat trying to balance on this wretched beast which was out of control. And as I moved forward to try and get hold of the reins just to stop it, the one piece of equipment that I had taken with me, a camera banned under the Taliban, slipped out of the folds of my burqa right into the passing view of a Taliban soldier. He saw this and went crazy. Now, I don't know whether the donkey stopped and threw me off, whether he stopped the donkey and pulled me off, what happened, I really can't remember. All I remember is hitting the ground at a great rate of speed and then picking myself up. And as I drew myself up, I looked straight into the face of this Taliban soldier through the grill of my burqa. And he was screaming and shouting at me. When I got back to London, some of my girlfriends said, what was going through your mind at that precise moment when you knew the game was up? And I said, well, for a nanosecond, and I said it was a nanosecond, I looked at this Taliban soldier and I thought, my goodness, you're gorgeous. <laughs> he had the most amazing green emerald eyes very high cheekbones and a great big beard with a life of its own. Very, very striking. But as I say, it was a nanosecond. And then I thought, oh, I've been caught. So I took my camera off and I handed it to him. And then I closed my eyes waiting to be shot in the head. And when I opened my eyes after a few seconds, he'd gone. He'd gone over to the man who hired the donkeys. He wanted to know who is in charge of this woman. And then he would get to the bottom of the camera. I was delighted. I thought I can get away. He still doesn't realize that there's a Westerner under the burqa. And I turned and went to attach myself to another group to follow them over the border. And as I walked away, I looked behind and by this time a crowd of about a hundred men had surrounded my two guides. And the soldier was in the middle and he's screaming and shouting and waving the camera at him. One of the guides had been smacked across the face and he had a bloody nose and the other one was trying to calm down the situation. And I looked and I thought, I can't leave them behind. Although we had made an agreement that if things did go pear-shaped, none of us knew each other, I couldn't abandon them. And so I went back and I tried to push my way through these very angry men, and they pushed me back. This was man's business. It had nothing to do with a woman. So in the end, I removed my burqa and said in a very loud voice, will somebody let me through? You could have heard a pin drop. And then there was a parting like the Red Sea as I 
walked towards the handsome soldier, who by this time was looking really gormless because his jaw just dropped as he saw a westerner, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, come towards him. And I thought, he is going to be so happy to have got his hands on a westerner that he'll forget all about my two guides. And as I walked, I shot them a sideways glance, and I could see by the full horror on their face that just when they thought things couldn't get any worse, they had. I had emerged. I went up to the soldier, demanded the return of my camera, and once he'd recovered, he got the three of us and we were bundled into a vehicle and taken off in the direction of Jalalabad. During the journey, the driver and the Taliban soldier had a very fierce exchange and they kept looking back at me and arguing and looking back and suddenly the driver did an emergency stop. The soldier asked me to get out of the car and then he took me to this raised piece of ground and asked me to stand on it from the way he was motioning. So I stood on this raised piece of ground and then he went off. He went marching off to my left and I thought, where's he gone? And I'm standing there, rigid with fear, don't move on this little tiny hill and I'm looking around and then I, all I can see are stones and pebbles and rocks and I thought, this is the stoning corner. I'm going to be stoned. He's gone off to get a crowd. <laughs> He's probably gone off somewhere to say, hey, I've got a westerner stoning in 10 minutes. So I'm standing there and I'm looking down and all I could see was blood red nail varnish coming up from my toes. I'd lost my socks and shoes in the melee and I thought, oh no, nail varnish is banned under the Taliban. If they see my toes, they'll probably chop them off one by one. So I try to cover my toes as well. And I don't know what it is about Afghanistan. The place can be deserted one minute and in the next 20 seconds, you can have a crowd. And about 20 seconds later, there were about 80 scary looking men staring back at me. And they were getting closer and closer. Of course, I'm thinking that they're getting closer and closer so they can take a good aim when the stoning starts. And I'm looking round at them and trying to find a kind face maybe a hero, somebody who will come to my defense. And I couldn't see one. Everybody just looked really hostile. Of course, the reason why they were getting closer and closer was to have a better look. Because in Taliban-ruled Afghanistan, no man saw another woman's face unless she was a mother, a sister, or a daughter, or a close female relative. So seeing me would be a bit like seeing a panda in the zoo for the first time. So they were getting closer. Of course, I'm thinking they're getting closer so they can take aim when the stoning starts. I mean, we can laugh about it now, but I really thought that the final minutes of my life were being played out in this godforsaken area. And as I looked around, they say that your life flashes before you. Mine didn't. I'm just thinking, how can I get out of this situation? And then I remembered my time as a Sunday school teacher. And there was a biblical scene where Jesus had said at a stoning, let him without sin cast the first stone. So I thought, right, I'm going to say that. Of course, it never occurred to me they wouldn't be able to understand me. But I thought, no, I'm going to say, okay then, bring it on, but let him without sin cast the first stone. And so I'm playing this out in my mind, and then I'm looking round, and I thought, no, there's probably some pious so-and-so at the back saying, that's me, and he'll start the stoning. So all of this is going through my mind 
when suddenly the Taliban soldier returns and he has with him a woman wearing a burqa. She comes up behind me and turns me around very briskly and starts to frisk me. And I thought, oh, they're not going to kill me. Well, not just yet anyway. They're trying to find out if I'm carrying any weapons. And isn't it strange that he's gone off to get a woman? You know, why wouldn't he just search me himself? Obviously showing more courtesy than British police. And so all the fear that I had felt and the terror just melted away with relief. And then I became very angry. Those men had made me feel as though I was going to die. So I pulled away from the Afghan woman and I swung round at these wretched men. And I was wearing, I want you to picture the scene, my burqa had gone, but I was wearing a shalwa kameez, um, the trousers and an orange dress down to the knees. And I swung round at these men, very angry, and I said, I am not carrying any weapons. And to emphasize this, I picked up the hem of my dress and said, look. <laughs> well, there was a collective sharp intake of breath. And then they all turned round and ran as though the devil was snapping at their heels. I don't know if any of you have seen the Carry On film where the Scottish regiment lift up their kilts at the natives and they run off, but it was the same effect. Of course, this was highly inappropriate behavior for a woman in Afghanistan, as I was to find out. And the lady wearing the burqa swung me back round and whacked me across the face. She was in such a state of shock at this vulgar display. Anyway, having established that I'm not carrying any weapons, I was then bundled back into the car and driven off to Jalalabad. I was taken into the intelligence headquarters and introduced to the head of intelligence, who understood a little bit of English. I apologized for causing any inconvenience, and he asked me to write down my personal details and telephone contacts to prove that I was a journalist. After I had done that, he said, we are about to eat. You must have something to eat. And I said, well, that's very kind, but I need to use the telephone first. And he said, no, you can't use the phone. So I said, in that case, I won't eat either as a guest or a prisoner of the Taliban until I can use the phone. And what started then was the war of attrition, which was to last 10 days. Now, you would think that the most evil, brutal regime in the world couldn't care less if one of their prisoners had gone on hunger strike. But these men were very, very upset. Despite my protest saying I'm not eating, every morning, noon, and night, they would bring me food. They would lay out a cloth on the floor, beautiful carpeted floor by the way, and uh, they would put down some bread, some stew, and um, some rice, and they would bring in a jug of water and a bowl, and they would wash my hands, and they would tell me in broken English, you are our sister, you are our guest. We want you to be happy. And I thought, what sort of evil, brutal regime is this? Don't they understand the job description? And I'm thinking, you know, this is just a trick. They're trying to soften me up. And then the really bad guys will come in with the electrodes. In fact, isn't it strange? Everything that I thought would have happened to me under this so-called savage primitive regime happened to um, prisoners in Abu Ghraib, in Guantanamo Bay, and other US holding facilities, which always prompts me to say, thank God I was captured by the most evil, brutal regime in the world and not by the Americans.
by the third day, they called the doctor. Not that I was feeling unwell at all, but they called the doctor and he came, a little man who trained in Germany. And he looked in my eyes, my ear, took my pulse, looked in my mouth, and I thought, they do this, don't they, on death row in Texas just before they're going to execute somebody. They like to make sure that they're fit and healthy. And then he took my blood pressure. And something bothered him because he then took it again. And I said, yes, I know I have high blood pressure. And he said, no, you don't. Your blood pressure is normal. I said, don't be so ridiculous. It can't be normal. You know, I'm about to be killed by the Taliban. How on earth is my blood pressure normal? And he said, look, and he did it again. And it was normal. I said, there you are, three days with the Taliban and you've cured my blood pressure. Thank you very much. <laughs> On the fifth day, there was a little guy called Hamid, the doctor's son actually, who acted as the translator and he came running into my room very, very excited. He said, you were on the front page of the papers and he brought in the weekly paper from Jalalabad. And although photographs were banned under the Taliban, there were two pictures of me from Reuters on the front page with a little story and headlines that took over half the page. The headlines looked longer than the story. And I said, what does the headline say? And he read it out and he said, it says, the Taliban has cured Yvonne Ridley's blood pressure and she's very happy. <laughs> Not the catchiest of headlines. <laughs> During those six days in Jalalabad, a procession of very scary, fierce-looking men came into the room and through Hamid asked me questions and the interrogations would go on and on until maybe eight, nine o'clock at night. They never physically threatened me. The worst thing that they said to me was, if you don't tell us the truth, you will be here for 20 years. I assured them that they would get sick long before I did. And I had um, decided on quite a risky strategy, really. I had decided to be the prisoner from hell. I had bought into the propaganda, you see, that this was the most evil, brutal regime in the world, and it didn't matter what I said or did, they were going to kill me at the end of the day, when they wanted to. And so I just thought, if I'm nice, they're going to kill me. If I'm nasty, they're going to kill me. Well, I'm just going to go down fighting. And so I was very abusive and aggressive. And the harder I pushed them, the nicer they were. And they would say, why are you angry? You are our guest. You are our sister. Hamid had to translate my words. And one day he said to me, I am terrified of these people and you should be as well and it's not nice for me to translate your words. I get scared. On the sixth day, Hamid came to see me and his face was nearly black with fear. His mouth was so dry he could hardly talk and he said, you have a very important visitor. And I said, who is it? He said, I can't tell you, but you must be respectful. I said, well, who is it? Is it Mullah Omar? And he said, please, just be respectful. You have to show some respect. This is a very, very important person. So I'm thinking, I wonder who it can be. Ten minutes later, there was a knock on the door. Although I was the prisoner, I had my own key. And so... I unlocked the door, <laughs> opened it, Hamid stood aside, and there in front of me was a man who made my blood run cold. The hair on the back of my neck lifted. For six days I had avoided talking about religion, 
and there in front of me was a religious cleric, a Milano. And everything in Afghanistan is dirty, ripped and torn and dusty. He was wearing an immaculate ivory gown, one which went right down to the ground. The Taliban's clothes were above their ankles. This guy's clothes were right down to the ground. You couldn't see his feet. And he had a great big ivory turban. A very modest beard by Afghan standards. Very light brown, modest beard and light brown eyes. And he had beads which he moved, like rosary beads, which he moved two at a time. And there was something else about him that I thought was weird. And when I mentioned it to my first Muslim crowd, a few of them went, Alhamdulillah. When I told them, I said, there was something really weird about this guy. He had a shine on his face. It was like a light on the inside coming out. I've never seen anything like it before. And I was told by my Muslim friends back in London, this is the nur, the light, that comes out of somebody who is very pious, very practicing, a very good person. I didn't know that at the time. I just thought there's something weird and spooky about this guy. After I recovered, I moved aside and invited him into my room. And he was so graceful and elegant, he didn't even seem to walk. He just glided in and glided down. And I sat opposite him and Hamid acted as the translator. And he said, what is your religion? And I thought, oh, here we go. I said, I'm a Christian. He said, yes, but what sort of Christian? Are you a Roman Catholic? Are you a Protestant? I said, I'm a Protestant from the Church of England. And he's smiling and moving his beads. And he said, and what do you think of Islam? Oh, I said, it's fantastic. It's absolutely wonderful. <laughs> of course, I knew nothing about Islam, very little, and the little that I knew was totally wrong as it turned out. And I went off in praise for two minutes of this faith that I knew so little about. And he smiled and he moved his beads. And then when I finally stopped, running out of adjectives, he said, Islam is a beautiful religion. I couldn't agree more. And then again, I ran off in praise of Islam. And he smiled as he listened, and Hamid translated. And I said, do you know, the people around here are so passionate about their faith that they pray five times a day. I know because I've watched and counted it. And he looked. He must have thought, you stupid woman. But I didn't realize that Muslims are expected to pray five times a day. So he moved his beads. And then he said, so, you would like to convert? And I thought, he's led me into a blind alley here. If I say, yes, I'll convert, He'll accuse me of being fickle and insincere, and he'll say, take her away and have her stoned. If I say, no, I'm not interested, he'll say, how dare you insult Islam, take her away and have her stoned. So I'm trying to come up with the right answer. And then, in the end, I said, look, I can't make such a life-changing decision while I'm in prison, but... If you let me go, I promise I will read the Quran and I will study Islam. And he smiled and he didn't say anything more and he rose up and he glided out. Hamid went scuttling after him and he returned a few minutes later and he said, you're going, you're going home on a red crescent plane. Well, I punched the air and congratulated myself for having dealt with this Milana, this religious man, in such a clever way. 
and within a few minutes, I, the little goods that I had accrued were in a plastic bag, and off I was in a truck heading for Kabul. Seven hours later, after a dusty, bumpy ride, we came into Kabul and drove straight past the airport. But I was okay, I just thought, well, there are other Westerners being held by the Taliban. We're probably gonna pick them up. All I know is that I'm going home on a Red Crescent plane. That night, I was to find out another aspect to the character of the Afghan people. They don't like giving you bad news. They don't like telling you anything that will upset you or cause an adverse reaction. And so we drove past the airport and then we pulled into a really grim prison. Everything that you would imagine a third world prison to be. And I was asked to get out and I got out and we walked down this dark, dingy corridor and then they pushed open this little metal door with a little spy hole in it. And there, sitting on a concrete floor, were two Afghan women, one with a babe in arms and the other one heavily pregnant. And they said, tonight you will stay here. And I said, no, 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 you've made a mistake. I am going home on a red crescent plane. Of course, the thing is, when you lead someone on, you have to deliver the bad news at some point. And so the bad news was delivered to me then. You're going nowhere, you were a bad woman, you entered our country illegally, without a passport, you have to be punished. I screamed and shouted, there was no way I was going to go into this cell and to get me out and get me to the airport. And I said to them, you can't do this to me, I'm British. And they smiled. <laughs> Just then, another cell door opened and six women wearing hijabs came out. And one of them said to me, are you from the Red Cross? I said, you speak English? And she said, well, I'm Australian. These three are Germans and the other two are Americans. And I went, oh my God, you're the Christians, the charity workers who were locked up for trying to convert Muslims to Christianity. And they said, yes. And I said, look, there's been a terrible mistake. I'm supposed to be going home on a red crescent plane. Will you tell these people? And the women all spoke the language. And I could tell by the heated conversation and the expressions on everyone's face that I was going nowhere that night, certainly not on a red crescent plane. Deanna Thomas, the Australian girl, said to me, look, why don't you stay in our cell tonight and then we can sort this mess out later. And in truth, I hadn't had any female company for over six days. These girls spoke my language. Furthermore, if I ever got out of this hellhole, I might have an even better story to tell. So I said, yes, okay and I followed them into their cell and I looked around and it was so grim. It's everything you would think a third world prison to be. And suddenly I broke down and I started to cry. The first tears that I had cried since my captivity. And I said, well, the Taliban have finally broken me. And amid the sobbing I felt for my cigarettes because although cigarettes were banned under the Taliban, when they realized I smoked, they gave me lots of cigarettes. So I pulled out my cigarettes and I was about to light up when I just said, oh, does anybody mind if I smoke? And the tears were coming down and I'm sobbing and about to light my cigarette when they all said, yes, this is a no smoking cell. How could I find the only no-smoking cell in Asia? How unlucky can you get? 
they said, look, if you must smoke, go outside into the courtyard. We're about to have a meeting. Suddenly, my nicotine craving went, and I said, a meeting? And they said, yes, we have two meetings a day. And I'm looking round and I'm thinking, what happens round here that they have two meetings a day? <gasps> it's the escape committee. <laughs> They're digging a tunnel, and this is a progress report. So I said, do you mind if I listen in to your meeting? And they said, no, not at all. So I suddenly forgot about my cigarettes for the time being, and I sat on the edge of this bunk bed, and the six girls sat in a circle on the floor, and then they pulled out their Bibles. And I'm thinking, I don't believe this. They have been charged under Sharia law with trying to convert Muslims to Christianity. They're in serious trouble. They could be executed. And now they're getting their Bibles out. And I'm looking at the door expecting the Taliban to come bursting in and beat them up or do something horrible to them. And nothing happened. Of course, as I did read the Quran later, it states quite specifically that we must, as Muslims, protect people of the book, i.e. Jews and Christians, and we must allow them to carry on and carry out and perform their faith. And this is exactly what the Taliban were allowing the Christians to do, although I didn't realize it at the time. So they read from the Bible, a very, a very loudly, a passage appropriate to their position. And after 20 minutes, they put their Bibles down and pulled out handwritten pieces of paper. And then they started to sing. Now, I can tell you, as you know, I was a a practicing Christian in those days. And when I say practicing, I probably went to church maybe twice a month, which in some people's eyes is bordering on fanaticism. And we would sing, you know, these Victorian hymns, and, uh, and they started singing, not Victorian hymns. We are talking very loud, very robust, happy clappy, full on Southern Baptist style, hallelujah type singing. So this started and at that point I went outside into the courtyard and I smoked three cigarettes off the trot. The azan, the call to prayer, started and I thought I don't believe it. I've got Muslims on that side of the wall, Christian fundamentalists in that cell. No wonder that religious cleric was smiling as they left me. He probably thought, she won't convert? Well, feed her to the Christians. <laughs> Although I make fun of them, I have to say that, their, that those six girls were incredibly strong and their faith did get them through their ordeal, which lasted much, much longer than mine. After they'd finished singing, they then started praying. And again, it was really full on, in your face, hallelujah type praying. In fact, at one point, they were all shouting different things. And at one point, I could hear one of the girls, I think it was the American girl, Heather, shouting, Lord Jesus, show me the way out of here. And I have a very gallows sense of humor, and I felt like shouting back straight down the corridor and turn left, but there's a great big talib there. <laughs> that night, I slept on this concrete floor with a very wafer-thin mattress. And when I woke up the next morning, I was given a change of clothes. In fact, I'm wearing the prison clothes now. Nobody 
put me in an orange jumpsuit, shaved, shackled, or abused me, or raped me, or sodomized me, or videoed me for the gratification or pleasure of others later on. As you can see um, from what I'm saying, my experience was completely different to those who fell into the hands of the Americans. So that morning, a new change of clothes, so I set about washing the old ones. And one of the German girls took me into the courtyard and gave me a metal bucket and took me to a hand pump and she said, you can get your water from there. And I'm looking at this contraption, which looked as though it had come from one of those old Western movies, and I started cranking it. And eventually some water came out, and I'm saying, this is amazing. How do they heat it underground? And she started laughing. She said, it's cold. I was given a pumice stone and uh, some soap flakes, and, and I set about washing uh, my clothes and I then hung them on the washing line in the prison courtyard. Within five minutes I'm sitting trying to enjoy the last days of the summer sun and the prison governor came in, a great big man with a huge beard and really a very scary looking dude and he came in and in broken English, he said to me, he growled at me, remove those garments. And I'm looking, I said, it's my washing. Remove them now. And I said, I can't. It's my washing. I am washing my clothes. This is a washing line. We dry our clothes on the washing line. Well, cover them up. And I'm looking, I said, you stupid man. You've obviously never done the washing in your life. How on earth will it dry if it's covered up? So he stood there for a couple of moments and then he said, well, take those items down. And he looked the other way and sort of pointed. And I realized he was talking about my underwear. And I said, no. This is the female wing of the prison. If you don't like what you see, clear off. He said, remove them. And I said, no, if you don't like them, you remove them. And I thought he was going to explode on the spot. He then went storming off. And he returned 15 minutes later with the deputy foreign minister of Afghanistan. These people are about to be bombed by the most powerful country on earth and a diplomatic incident was unfolding as a result of my underwear. <laughs> I don't want to embarrass the men here, but I mean we're not talking anything small, salacious and lacy. We're talking big, comfortable Bridget Jones. So the Deputy Foreign Minister said to me, will you please remove your undergarments from the line? And I said, look, this is the female wing of the prison. There are no male prisoners. The only men around at the moment are you two. If you clear off, there will be no men. By the time they're dried, nobody's going to be any the wiser. He said, yes, but the Taliban soldiers live above the female wing of the prison. And if they look out and see those things, they'll have impure thoughts. I'm looking at my underwear in a new light now. I said, there's a very easy solution to this. He said, I knew there would be. I said, tell your men not to look out of the window. No, no, that's impossible. I thought, I cannot believe this. You know, America didn't need to fly over in B-52s and bomb these people. They should have just parachuted in a regiment of women soldiers waving their underwear. 
and the Taliban would have gone. <laughs> but it gives you a remarkable insight into the modesty of these people and the way they felt about issues like women's underwear. So the argument continued and went on long after the clothes had dried and nobody emerged as a real winner, but I did get my dry clothes back. The next day, the ninth day, I was feeling really crotchety. I'd had um, three or four really rousing sessions with the, um, the, the Christian services. And in fact, you know, although the Taliban had uh, banned singing and they banned music, they allowed them to sing, but they drew the line at music. And I am eternally grateful to this day that they confiscated their tambourines and guitars. But, um, so I'm feeling really wretched and bad-tempered and, and thinking I'm never going to get out of this place. I can't take much more of this. And the deputy foreign minister returned with his sidekick, a man I called the smiling assassin. And he said, we want to ask you a few more questions. And I said, no, I'm done with um, answering any more questions. I'm finished with you people. I've had enough. And um, I then launched into a series of insults and curses and swearing. And then I rounded it off with something that I've never done in my life before. I've never done since. And you would get sent off a football pitch for doing it. I spat at them. And then I went into my cell and I started shaking. And a couple of the Christian girls said, did you just do what we thought you did. And I said, yes, I've gone beyond the line. I've gone beyond the wire. I've pushed it and pushed it and I'm in serious trouble now. I can sense it. And just then one of the female prison officers came in and which was translated for me later. And she said, tell the English woman she is going to be flogged because she cannot do this to high ranking people. So I'm standing there, rigid with fear, cursing me and my big mouth, and wondering, is there going to be a public flogging? Will Al Jazeera be there to record it? You know, what, what, is, what is going to happen? And I'm standing there, rigid with fear, and about 10, 15 minutes later, we heard the gates open in the courtyard, and Heather one of the American girls came running in and she said, they've returned, Yvonne is going to be flogged. And just then, three of the Christians threw themselves down at me and grabbed onto my clothes and started saying, Lord Jesus, don't let Yvonne feel any pain. And I'm standing there looking at them thinking, you know, you're making it worse. <laughs> and just then the smiling assassin walked in and he had in his hand the one thing that I wanted, the very thing I had gone on hunger strike for nine days earlier. He had in his hand a satellite phone and he strutted around the cell and showed off this satellite phone and he said, all of you, all of you can ring home. You can all ring your families today. Apart from her, the English woman, she's horrible and she spat at us and she has to be punished. So it's interesting, this is how the most evil, brutal regime in the world decided to punish me. They allowed my cellmates to ring home, which was fantastic. For the Germans, they hadn't, and, and all of them, they hadn't spoken to their family for two months. It was an opportunity to ring home and say, look, we're okay, we're, we're holding out. And then one of the German girls went to the smiling assassin and made a special plea and said, look, Yvonne needs to talk to her daughter. Please let her call home. And he said, no. She's a horrible woman. She has to be punished. 
And as I say, that was my punishment, which I, looking back, think, um, you know, shows a, a degree of uh, wisdom and insight on their part, which is more than can be said for my behavior. And, and my only mitigation is, look, I hadn't eaten for nine days and, and I was starting to get fractures. That afternoon, the um, senior officers returned and they removed me without warning, got my things together and said, you're going. And then they took me out of the prison and upstairs into the Taliban sleeping quarters. And one of the senior officers had vacated his room and said, you complained about the prison downstairs. Is this good enough for you? And it was a very nice room by Afghan standards. And he said, tomorrow you will go home, inshallah. And I said, what is this inshallah you keep using at the end of every sentence and it never ever happens? <laughs> of course, I now know inshallah means God willing. And they put me in this room, they gave me the key I locked myself in. I had a fantastic view over the city of Kabul, looking right up to Kabul Hill where all the anti-aircraft units were. And I sat on the bed, contemplating my future, wondering if and when I'd ever get out. They kept saying, tomorrow you will go home, inshallah, but inshallah it never happened. And so I was wondering how genuine they actually were. Why had they removed me from the Christians? Was this my last night on earth? Would they execute me tomorrow? I really didn't know all of this was going through my mind. And then suddenly there was a huge rip as though somebody had just torn the sky open. And there was a great big light and it was the start of the war. That night, America and Britain dropped 50 cruise missiles on Kabul. You can hear a cruise missile from 20 miles away. These were coming within a quarter of a mile of the prison. I had covered wars before, and I don't know why it had not occurred to me then, but it certainly occurred to me that night these bombs don't discriminate. There's nowhere to run, there's nowhere to hide. Civilian, military, man, woman, child, these bombs cannot tell the difference. I'm going to be blown apart by a British bomb. I've got no doubt Tony Blair will blame the Taliban and that will be the end of that. And it was truly terrifying. And I also thought, there is no way the Taliban will let me go now. Absolutely no way at all. And the next morning, there was a knock on my door, and I was told, please, there is a vehicle outside. We are going to release you. I couldn't believe it. But sure enough, there was a vehicle. They put me in it. We drove down from Kabul through Jalalabad, down to Torkham, and eventually, after some shenanigans, I was handed over to the Pakistan authorities. And as I walked back across no man's land, the camera lights went up and the journalists started shouting, how did the Taliban treat you? And in truth, up until the point that I was released, I still didn't trust them one inch, and I thought everything that they were trying to do had a hidden motive. It was only at the point that they released me that I thought, you know what, they were quite an honorable bunch of guys. So when this journalist shouted at me, how did the Taliban treat you? I thought for a while, and then I said, with respect and courtesy. This is not what the Western media wanted. The Western media wanted Abu Ghraib tales. They wanted abuse, rape, torture. They wanted to see scars. They wanted to see tears. 
There was nothing, nothing I could give them other than the truth. And sadly, for some people, the truth is never enough. When I got back to London, about two weeks later, one of my guides on the Pakistan side called me and he said, Madam, the village that you visited has been bombed by the Americans. That was the village Karma, which is smaller than this hall we're in now. And I said, look, Pasha, I know these terrible things happen in the fog of war. And it's awful, but these accidents do happen. And he said, but madam, how can you accidentally bomb a village the size of Karma three days running? Now then, the Americans were telling us all about their strategic strikes, their surgical strikes, their B-52 bombers coming at 30,000 feet. Karma wouldn't have even looked like a dot from 30,000 feet. It was quite clear to me that this was indiscriminate bombing of civilian areas. And in many ways, the Taliban were to blame because they kicked out all of the Western journalists. Whatever you think about journalists, we do have our, our functions and our role. We are the eyes, the ears, the witnesses. And by kicking out all of the Western journalists, they ensured that Britain and America could and would bomb indiscriminately across the country slaughtering innocent civilians, which they did. That propelled me into the anti-war movement and made me become very, very active as, a, as an anti-war uh, campaigner. At that same time, I remembered the promise that I had given to the religious cleric and I thought, well, against all the odds, they kept their word. While they hung on to the Christians, they let me go. And really, I should keep my promise now. And I started to read the Quran. Very soon, groups of Muslims found out, and somebody gave me a wonderful English translation by A. Yasuf Ali with a, um, an index in the back. So I thought, great, I'll get this over and done with very quickly. I'm going to cherry pick and I'm going to read all about the subjugation and oppression of women and what promotes people to slam planes into towers. So I started cherry picking and going through all the women's issues. And then I had other Islamic literature to support my reading of the Quran. I couldn't believe what I was reading. The Quran makes it perfectly clear, crystal clear, no two ways about it. Women are equal in spirituality, worth, and education. Furthermore, the first convert to Islam was a woman. The first martyr to Islam was a woman. Women played major roles right from day one in Islam. They fought alongside the men. The Prophet, peace be upon him, picked out one particular woman and singled her out for praise during a battle, the Battle of Ehud. And he said, everywhere I looked, this woman was there, protecting me, fighting with me, fighting alongside me. I thought, where have we got this idea that women are oppressed and subjugated? Where do we get it from? Who put the poison in our minds? I then looked at property rights, inheritance rights, divorce rights. What's yours is yours, what's his is half of yours. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> Much of it could have been written by a Californian lawyer. In fact, this is from where they probably get their inspiration. All these tales in the tabloids about the superstars having 
prenuptial contracts and teams of lawyers drawing up and thrashing out these prenuptial contracts. They were available to Muslim women from day one. And so I began to see Islam in a totally different light. And I thought, yes, okay, this is great, but what are the people like? And so I went out into the Muslim communities, specifically to meet the sisters. And it didn't matter where I went in the world, whether it was Pakistan, in, um, or whether it was Saudi, or Canada, or America, or Australia, and now New Zealand, the Muslim women I have met, whether they have been formally educated or not, are resilient, strong, politicized, internationally aware, multi-skilled, multi-talented. A few years ago, I would have looked in this room and picked out everyone wearing a hijab, and I would have thought, oh, look at those poor, oppressed women. How did they manage to sneak out of the home to come here? Now I'm looking, and I'm trying to work out who is the engineer, who is the doctor, who is the lawyer, who is the teacher, who is doing the PhD, who's doing the MA, who's raising kids at the same time, supporting their man, running a business, a charity, who is the backbone of the community. I see incredibly diverse women. And I remember a sister in Canada who said to me, Yvonne, my head might be covered, but my mind is not. And the most valuable lesson that I learned from the sisters that I met is never ever again will I judge a person's freedoms and liberties by the length of their skirt. So this was wonderful. The other thing that I learned about the Muslim community is it has an incredibly gossipy network. And I could visit somebody in Glasgow one day, and by the next morning I'd get a phone call from somebody in Karachi saying, I hear you were in Scotland. How did it go? The communication is amazing, but sometimes there were Chinese whispers and people had false information that I had taken my shahada, the oath to become a Muslim. And I remember one day, I'm sure many of you in this hall will have at least heard the name. One day I got a phone call from Sheikh Abu Hamza al-Masri, the fire and brimstone cleric from Finsbury Park Mosque, who is currently detained at Her Majesty's pleasure in Belmarsh. And he rang me up and he said, Sister Yvonne, welcome to Islam. And I said, well, thank you very much. However, I hate to disappoint you, but you're a wee bit premature. I haven't taken my shahada yet, but, you know, I will get there, inshallah. And he said, well, take your time. This is going to be the most important decision you ever make in your life. Don't be rushed into it. Don't be pressurized into it. Make sure that you read as much as you can. Be convinced before you take your shahada. We are all making dua, prayer for you. And I thought, I can't believe that this is the fire and brimstone cleric from Finsbury Park Mosque. The tabloids loved to hate him um, because of his hooks and his eye patch, and they really have demonized him. And I said, well, thank you very much for your understanding. I will keep you informed with my progress. And I was just about to close the line when he said, well, there's just one thing I want you to know. And I said, well, what's that? He said, well... If you go out tomorrow and you're hit by a bus, you will go straight to hellfire. I said, thank you. 
and closed the line. And that made me nervous. It made me very nervous. So I took a copy of the Shahada and I carried it round with me. And I would address meetings like this and I would say, look, if you come across an accident and you hear someone shouting for two Muslim witnesses, please come running fast because it's me trying to get in before it's too late. <laughs> Happily, there was no such accident. And on June the 30th in 2003, at 11.30 in the morning, I took my shahada and declared my belief that there is only one God and that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is his messenger. <laughs> and I joined then what I consider to be the biggest and the best family in the world. And I know that wherever I go in the world, it doesn't matter how remote the place is, I will meet brothers and sisters who will give me their love and support and help if I need it. And that is very important to me. I was also lucky enough in January this year to go on Hajj, the annual pilgrimage which Muslims are required to do at least once in their life. As I say, the Saudi women don't think for one minute that they're oppressed or subjugated. They're like a tightly coiled spring and they are really ready to launch into the political scene in Saudi Arabia. There were elections earlier this year. Women weren't allowed to vote. Let me tell you, I really feel that the next elections, not only will women be voting, they will be standing as well. These women are really, really remarkable. And as I say, they're in the wings and they're ready to launch. Unfortunately, because of Saudi's restrictive media rules, we hardly get to find out any real news that is happening there. But these sisters from Jeddah told me how distressed they were during the second intifada, the uprising in Palestine, how distressed they were and they had been discussing this in the mosque after Friday prayers. And they wanted to show their solidarity with their Palestinian sisters. So they did something that um, is forbidden in Saudi. They had a spontaneous demonstration. And they shouted and demonstrated. And the police were called because of, of this uh, public disorder. And the police moved in. And one of the, the main women stood in front of the police and she said, dare one of you touch us. We are Saudi women and you cannot touch us. And the police sprang back and they were wondering what on earth are we going to do with these women? We can't have them demonstrating, but they're right. We can't manhandle them and cart them off to jail either. And there was this standoff for about half an hour as the women continued with their protest. In the end, the police chief had a better idea and they went and arrested all their husbands instead. <laughs> they took them to the station and they said the next time their wives did this, they would be charged. Which um, is a wonderful tale. So that was um, Hajj in January. Obviously, you're all aware of the London bombings. I live in central London. We were shocked by the ferocity of the atrocity, but not surprised. The anti-war movement and the political party I belong to called Respect, which is led by George Galloway MP, had said 
Long before the first bombs dropped on Baghdad, we told Tony Blair, if you take us into a war with Iraq, our security will vanish. London will become a target. In his arrogance, he dismissed us. He dismissed the fears of two million people who marched in London. He would rather take his orders from Washington. Really, I salute New Zealand in its strength and determination to stand up to America over many different issues. That's stand. It should be me applauding you. That stand has made New Zealand one of the safest places on earth in terms of security and certainly your anti-nuclear stance is admirable. Beware of siren calls from politicians like Winston Peters who thrive only on hate. You have a very important election coming up soon. I can't tell you how to vote, but just be wary of those who would want to stand shoulder to shoulder with George Bush because you will end up in serious trouble like we have in Britain. Thank you very much for listening to me. I am really looking forward to hearing your questions and observations. As I say to the non-Muslims here tonight, I am not Islam's answer to Billy Graham. I am not here to get you to convert. But if you are interested in learning a little bit more about Islam, for your own benefit, not for any other reason, there's some books outside which you're welcome to take away. Thank you very much for being a terrific audience. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, sister. Thank you very much. Beautiful speech. I just wanted you to talk a bit more about the anti-war movement. Um, the reports we've got here is that the comments by George Galloway were pretty much ridiculed by the wider media, certainly by Tony Blair. Um, and it was very disheartening that after all those marches and demonstrations, the war still went ahead. And so. What progress, what hope is there? The Stop the War Coalition was absolutely devastated when the war began because, as I say, more than two million of us marched in London, five million in Italy, millions more across Europe, half a million in Berlin. And I believe that um, Australia and New Zealand, you had your own marches as well. Okay, we didn't stop the war, but I'll tell you something now. We saved lives because the Pentagon and the military strategists had to change their modus operandi. They had planned to bomb every town, every city, every village in Iraq for 40 days and 40 nights to soften up the country before they sent in the troops. We know that more than 100,000, and this is a conservative figure, more than 100,000 innocent civilians have been slaughtered by George Bush and Tony Blair's bombs since the start of the war. I was speaking to a Sheikh Majid al Gaud in Fallujah a few weeks ago, and he said that their estimates are that the figure is nearer half a million. But the, the anti war movement goes on, it's very, very active, and the backbone of the movement is supplied by the Muslim community in Britain by the Muslim Association of Britain. 
Hundreds of thousands of Muslims marched alongside hundreds of thousands of um, people from the left, socialists, people from the right, people from all walks of life on February the 15th, 2003. And as I say, we didn't stop the war, but I'm sure that we saved lives. And what we have done, what we have done is we have ensured that Britain certainly will no longer go into any military adventures with George Bush. Because if Blair dare take the army, the British army, into any other military adventures, any other illegal wars, we in Britain will not only march, we will riot and we will bring him down. All due respect to your experience as well as to the power of a lot of Muslim women and the kindness of a lot of Muslim men, a lot of Muslims in New Zealand or from our experience have arrived as refugees from the Taliban. And so I wonder how you would answer to a lot of women in this room that have suffered after, um, under the Taliban for what you've been saying about your personal experience, who you were a Western journalist there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's a very good um, question. And I have actually met some Afghan women who did flee the Taliban. Um, I met them in Christchurch and they listened to my story and they thanked me for it. The reality is that the Taliban were no more brutal than the previous regime and certainly this regime um, leaves a lot to be desired. For instance, the prison where I was held, I returned, I've been back to Afghanistan four or five times and I went to it and it is jammed with young girls aged 12 to 16 whose only crime is that they've run away from home because they don't want to be sold off as child brides, a practice that the Taliban had stamped out. And these child brides are expected to marry men twice and three times their age. Yes, the feared vice and virtue squad has gone, but in Herat it has been replaced by another equally odious group, uh, loosely translated, it's called the Chastity Squad, and these are pulling in young girls aged 12 to 16 again, and having them internally examined to see if they are still virgins. There are no career women emerging from the rubble of Afghanistan. There are a few little green shoots of hope, but that's about it. Karzai made such a big deal um, when uh, he announced that uh, Seema Sama was to become the first Afghan woman's minister. I went to Afghanistan in February 2002 to interview her. I couldn't even find her. The Karzai government hadn't even given her an office in the government building. It was all lip service. And she was eventually hounded out of that position in the summer with death threats. The only success story in Afghanistan at the moment um, is the production of opium, which has made Afghanistan the number one heroin producer in the world. The city where I was held, Jalalabad, now has hardcore porn for sale in DVDs in the front windows. These are, I come from, I live in Soho, London's red light district, and I can tell you now, these DVDs wouldn't even be sold under the counter in Soho, but they're in the front windows in Afghanistan. What we have given the Afghan people is drugs and porn, and I'm no doubt sure they've got the rock and roll as well. One of the most respected charities, Medicine Sans Frontier, pulled out its entire operation with great reluctance last year after half a dozen of its people had been murdered near Bamiyan. 
They knew who had carried out the murder, somebody closely related to a friend of the Afghan government, and there was a refusal to hold an investigation. And that is why Medicine Sans Frontier pulled out of Afghanistan. And it was an excellent charity as well. Hamid Karzai is laughingly called the mayor of Kabul because he's lost control of his country outside of the capital. And the Taliban are coming back. They're in control in certain provinces in Afghanistan. And I can tell you something else. When I have traveled around Afghanistan, quite a few people, including the women, have said, we wish they were back. Now, I'm not a supporter of the Taliban, but at least under the Taliban, there was security. That security has gone. And the other thing that the Afghan women tell me is, will the West please drop this obsession with the burqa? Tell us how we can get our children educated Tell us how we can put food on the table. Tell us how it can be safe for me to walk down the street without being raped. Tell me how, never mind about turning me into a career woman, how can I get my husband a job so he can work to put food on the table. When you've sorted this out, then we'll talk about the burqa. So don't for one moment think that Afghanistan is a success story. It's an absolute nightmare disaster where 20,000 American soldiers are committing war crimes on a weekly basis and innocents are still being slaughtered in that country. As you are a converter to Islam, how would you express the jihad to non-Muslims? How would I explain jihad? Jihad, don't Muslims. My own personal jihad is my cigarettes. I'm trying to quit. Jihad is a struggle. There are many levels, but that is my jihad at the moment. Uh, my question relates to uh, your time as a journalist in the workings of the media. This is something that baffles us as Muslims. And I'd like you to shed some light on this, working both from the inside as well as looking at it from the outside now. Uh, one of the uh, things that I would like to understand is what are the sentiments of journalists and what are the sentiments of the media people when they report on issues that relate to Muslims and Islam. And I'd like you to shed some light on that. And I'd just like to highlight a comment that I picked up the other day in the New Zealand Herald. It was, there was a comment that came from some expert who was talking about how to spot a terrorist in a neighborhood or something to that effect. And the comment that was relayed or written down, it said, there are three people in, there are three groups of people in Europe that you can identify as terrorists coming from the Muslim community. The first one is immigrants. Second one is second generation Muslim. And the third one are converts. I'm not sure what that leaves for the rest of the people, but I mean, you fall in one of the groups. So my question is, uh, now, how do these comments get through the editorial process? And what are the sentiments of the media and the people working in the media when they do write things like this? It's very easy to spot a terrorist. There were eight of them in Scotland the other week at the G8. One of them lives in the White House. Another one lives in Downing Street. And the biggest terrorist, the biggest war criminal, is in Israel. He's called Ariel Sharon. As a journalist, I would love just to scrap the word terrorist. It is meaningless. Nelson Mandela, one of the most revered statesmen in the world, was called a terrorist by Margaret Thatcher. If you ask an Afghan farmer what is a terrorist, he'll tell you it was the guy who flew over his land and in a B-52 bomber and dropped bombs that are still exploding, exploding, killing and maiming today. If you ask a Palestinian child what is a terrorist, 
She'll tell you it's the Palestinian soldier who killed her sister. If you ask a Chechnyan what is a terrorist, he will tell you it is Putin who is using the war on terror to slaughter the Chechnyans. We all have different definitions of terrorists. I would completely, as a journalist, like to ban the word. And as for journalists, these are very troubled times, and finding good journalists is very, very difficult. But there are a few, and what I would say to you all is to go onto the internet and find them and learn to trust your sources and try and seek corroboration. The media has done a great disservice to the Muslim community around the globe. Part of it is due to ignorance and part of it is due to an Islamophobic attitude by some of the newspaper publishers. And while we're on the subject, I would just like to address the agenda program on Sunday which featured a Muslim who said that our universities in New Zealand are in the hands of Muslim radicals that have become breeding grounds for Muslim radicals. He was talking absolute, complete nonsense, and this is one of the most disgraceful pieces of journalism I have seen since I've been here. There is no corroboration to his story. He has an ax to grind. He's a very unhappy young man. And um, what he said was completely untrue. I have been to Auckland University today and more or less said that. We are living in very dangerous times and we have to be careful to be able to disseminate what is true and what is not. And we have to be very, very wary of the siren calls. And what I would say to Winston Peters is, there's a village in New Zealand looking for its idiot. You'd better go home, mister. Uh, thank you, um, Yvonne. If you look back on the history, in 20 years back, we used to see the capitalist power and the socialist power, which is held by the American and the Russians. And but somehow, the socialist power was empowered by the capitalists. Can we say that now, what's happening now, is the Islam become a replacement of the socialist power? I think that um, America is the type of country that has to have some sort of enemy. And I was looking into America's history for a paper I was writing a few weeks ago. And America has been at war either internally or internationally every single year since its inception with the exception of 1892. Now, I don't know what happened in 1892, other than that was the year my favorite soccer team, Newcastle United, was formed. But America is a warry nation, and it has to have an enemy. At first, it was the indigenous population, the real Americans, the Indians. Then it started on the Mexicans. Then it went land grabbing round California. Then it got involved in the Civil War and it has continued. And for the last 50 years, it has been at war every single year, bombing more than 20 different countries. This is not a peaceful nation. It has to have an enemy. Communism has gone and it has been, I feel, replaced by Islam. Islam is an easy target for the um, American administration and it's very easy to whip up hysteria and hate against the Muslim community. And we really have to stick together 
and to be united on this, and I'm not just talking to the Muslims, I'm talking to everybody, because once America has finished with the Muslims, it could turn on anybody next. You know, it could be you. So, you know, these are, are very dangerous days, and that's why I would urge you to be very careful when you see big scare headlines demonizing the Muslim community. I'm actually come along tonight and I first of all want to thank you for your heart-wrenching story that you've told tonight. We were invited tonight and myself and two other colleagues from the Māori party and I need to say please don't judge all Māoris by Winston Peters. He does not represent us. Living, sorry, living in this country, we have lived here for thousands of years. It has taken us 165 years to finally get to the point where we are just a minority in our own country. Our leaders today, in fact, Tariana Turia said that the claims by Mr Peters is political posturing at its very worst. We are the party that is coming out for all minority groups and saying, come with us, come with the tangata whenua, because we have been here for thousands of years. I challenge you, I ask you, I beg you, come to a marae, come and meet our leaders who disagree also with what these politicians are doing, the things that they are saying. You said at the end of your, your speech there about how safe it is here. What we need to tell you is that there are some unsafe things happening here as well. And not to put the fear, but to say, all these minority groups, we have to come together. We really do. We have two major parties out there, but we have minority groups if we only come together. Because I can tell you, my leaders, Dr. Peter Sharples and Tariana Turia, share your views. That is why they go out into the newspapers and they say, we support the Muslim community here in New Zealand. <laughs> Kia ora. Did you get the message? <laughs> my, my sister, it's not only in Afghanistan that we have strong women. Um, first of all, I have to tell you, you have to be grateful to God for this donkey because he gave you the chance. And we all have to have some chance in our life to come to Islam. But what I wanted to ask you, I'm not very political. I wanted to ask you because you're involved in um, women's rights. And unfortunately, the truth of the world is that we have the Quran, which teaches us that women are equal, that women have rights, that there is justice, that these rights must be enforced. But unfortunately, we also have culture in a lot of areas which is used to override this. In some cases, they pervert the religion to support their cause, as every religion has been perverted throughout history. And, um, as an ex-Christian, I can say that nobody actually believes that the Inquisition was a Christian thing to do either. But what is um, happening now, and is there, you don't have a lot of time tonight, but is there a website or somewhere we can get more information about what you're doing and what, what we can do to help? Right. Um, I do have my own website, which is uh, www.yvonneridley.com. But um, there's also a, a website up, um, up here um, for uh, anyone in New Zealand who's interested in the Muslim community. You are right, there are male-dominated um, cultures that uh, do behave in an un-Islamic way. The only way that we're going to overcome this is to educate the women about their rights over their men and educate the men about their rights over their women and um, education is uh, is very important and uh, that is the way forward but um, don't anyone run away with the idea that um, oppressed women are only from the Muslim communities 
I could take you back to my hometown in the north of England and, um, and you would see that uh, it is something that isn't exclusive to um, Muslim communities. It's a global problem. Yes, Yvonne. I listened to quite a few of your statements here and it sends the mind wandering all over the planet. When you mention Bill Marsh, there's also a place in Scotland called, called Dungavel. It's on a place with Parimarimarimo. And when you look at these different governments, or parliaments, or White Houses, you make the very valid point they're not to be trusted. Nor is the media, as the media is only uh, there to dictate what the people want to hear. They've got people split up like Goebbels had before the First World War, and you look at the Second World War, I should say, and when you look at people were divided there, they had German against German, British against British, and the common denominator has been missing in the speech tonight, or in the address tonight. These various politicians, they're totally dependent on capital. And when you look at the huge finance houses and investment houses, they dictate terms to whichever government they're going to give money to. And as far as Winston Pierce goes, he's no different from any other politician that's not telling the truth. Incidentally, Pierce is like myself, he's half Irish, half Scots, um, he's half Scotch, half Murray. What are we all? We're merely human beings under the dictates of imperialism and capitalism. And what's happening in New Zealand right now, we've seen an insidious way that the media is playing one group off against the other, the same as it's did in any previous wars or any reason it did cause dissent among the working class. I agree wholeheartedly with what you say. And, um, you know, if we have a bad media, it's our fault. If you don't like what you read, send in a letter and complain. You actually can change the media if you do it collectively and demand a better service. Um, editors do monitor the volume of letters that come in. And if they get a lot of letters on one particular theme, even though they might only print one or two, they will be aware that there is concern there. So it's important not only to use places like this as an arena to sound off, but also to put your feelings in letters and send them off as well. Assalamu alaikum, Yvonne. I have a question for you. The American spin doctors have advised President Bush to stop using the phrase war on terrorism and call it struggle against extremist violence. If struggle means a jihad, do you think the Americans are now launching their own jihad movement? Your comments, please. Thank you. Um. As I said before, the, the Americans, well, it's not the Americans. I mean, we've got to be careful not to demonize the Americans. 50 million Americans did not vote for George Bush. Um, so, you know, we must remember that. And it's bad enough that we have to talk about him now. It must be hell actually having to live in a country that's been run by him when you haven't voted for him. Um, American imperialism has, uh, has been at the heart of most of the world's wars in the last century. And in fact, if you look at American foreign policy for the future, they use a term called full spectrum dominance. And this is what they are setting out to do, full spectrum dominance. And it means they want to control the land, the sea, the sky, and outer space. They want to control it all. Um, but it isn't for the Americans, because don't believe all this rubbish about the American dream. We all see the Hollywood images of um, large Manhattan apartments with six friends living and having happy lives and, and uh, all the other Hollywood images. The reality is, over 50 million people in America are without basic health care. Infant mortality rates are higher in some states than in parts of Latin America. 
Um, black men in Detroit have a lower life expectancy than men living in Bangladesh. The American dream is only for a select few, for the American imperialists, for the neocons who are in the White House. And don't even think that they care about the armies that they send out to invade Muslim lands. These um, soldiers, there are 40,000 soldiers called green card soldiers. These are kids from Guatemala, Mexico, and other countries who have been promised fast-track citizenship if they join up um, for Uncle Sam. So, you know, there are, there are two levels. There are the, the neocons, and then there are the ordinary people. And as I say, um, more than 50 million Americans did not vote for Bush, so we should really be careful to differentiate. Yvonne, I have a son and two daughters. I cannot imagine living in a system where my son would feel it his duty to express his disapproval of my daughter's boyfriend by killing her. When will honest killings cease in the Middle East? Um, well, it's not just the Middle East, it's across Asia as well, and it's not just a Muslim problem. It, um, it's a cultural problem. And um, it's actually not just reserved to those areas because uh, it, 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 it is a much wider problem. But please, for one moment, don't think it's a Muslim problem. And please, for one moment, don't think that honor killings have anything at all to do with Islam, because uh, they certainly don't. Um, how do you explain your life after being a Muslim, uh, doing your day-to-day -day activities and praying five times in a day, and continue your profession? Because a lot of women who are not Muslims may believe that if they join Islam they're not able to continue their profession or they're not able to do their own day-to-day -day activities. How do you explain your life after being a Muslim? Thank you. There is absolutely nothing that a Muslim woman can do that a Western woman can't and vice versa. Um, we all aspire to pray five times a day. Sometimes I get there, sometimes I don't. Each day I'm evolving and developing to improve myself as a Muslim. But wearing a hijab does not um, weigh me down and prevent me from doing things. And, um, and I was just saying to somebody a few days ago that, um, that it, you know, I still do things like whitewater rafting, like um, uh, windsurfing, and I wear my hijab and it, it doesn't tip over the sails. You know, it's, uh, it can be quite an asset, in fact. Um, there, there is nothing that, that women around the world cannot do if they set their minds to it. And um, whether they're Muslim, Christian, Jewish, atheist, Hindu, Sikh, um, there's nothing that any of us can't do. I come here not as a Muslim, and I came here to learn about Muslimism and not about politics. But what does fascinate me is that the realm of suicide bombers that are going either be it in the Middle East, be it in London, wherever, and who do it in the name of Muslim, how they can justify that to themselves and how we can, as a caring populace, change that very culture because it seems as an outsider to be so imbued in them. They don't care what it does to their families, nor to anybody else, the other people that they kill. And I think it's a very real problem for the world to try and give that sense of caring back to those disaffected people. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, that's, um, that's a, a, a great question. And you can't um, just lump all of those people into one area. 
I actually looked into the background of a so-called suicide bomber in Palestine two years ago to try, and it was research I was doing for a book, to try and understand what makes a young man want to blow himself up. And this particular young man, his father had cancer, but it was curable. All he needed to do was to walk out of his house, go across the road, go through an Israeli checkpoint, and go to the hospital five minutes away, every day for chemotherapy, and his cancer would be cured. The Israeli checkpoint refused to allow him through, and eventually the cancer went from being curable to terminal. Now I want you all to imagine this is your father. This is your father who's suddenly gone from having curable cancer to terminal cancer. You're watching him die. There is nothing you can do. The soldiers at the Israeli checkpoint are refusing to let him through for treatment. And I actually had some non-Muslim students from Bristol University, I was telling them this tale, and I said, come on, what are you going to do? Your father is dying in front of your eyes, what are you going to do? And one of them said, well, I would uh, write to the UN. And I said, well, that's very nice. Israel has violated and ignored more than 72 UN rules and regulations. They're not going to take any notice of the UN, not for your father. Come on, what are you going to do? And they were getting really upset and agitated. And really, one of them was nearly in tears because he could see, it's my father, what am I going to do to help him? And his father died, the most excruciating painful death imaginable because he didn't even have painkillers. I'm not justifying what that young man did, but that was his background. In Chechnya, you have the black widows, the women who also strap explosives to themselves and blow themselves up. They're using their bodies as weapons. It's the only thing they've got. If they wanted to really commit suicide, they would slash their wrists and be done. They're trying to fight a war. Chechnya is the forgotten Palestine. You look at every single profile of a so-called Chechnyan black widow. Invariably, their husbands have gone, disappeared, murdered by the Russian army. When the Beslan school atrocity happened, and over 300 children died in that horrendous situation last year, nobody would have cried harder than the Chechnyan mothers because in the last decade, they have lost 42,000 of their children. They know what the pain is like. And when you've lost your children, and your husband, and you've been gang raped by Russian, drunken Russian soldiers, maybe there is nothing left inside, and you want to fight back, and you fight back the only way you think you can. I'm not justifying it, but look at the backgrounds of these people. The London bombings, the only surprise was that it didn't happen sooner. We knew it was linked to the illegal war in Iraq. And you know, we've had two minutes silence for the innocent victims, more than 3,000 in 9-11. We had two minutes silence for those beautiful young people who perished in Bali, for the people who were killed 
in Kenya, Indonesia, Madrid, and now London. And then yesterday, another unexpected innocent victim of the war on terror, a young Brazilian man who was buried just a few hours ago in his hometown after being shot dead by British police. We've had two minutes silence for all of those people. But what about the deafening silence of the hundreds of thousands of innocents who've died in Palestine, in Iraq, Afghanistan, Chechnya, Kashmir, Uzbekistan? You know, it's when 9-11 happened, one of the things that was played over and over again, I remember, was one of the passengers from the plane who realized she was going to die. And she picked up her cell phone and switched it on, and she dialed her home. Nobody was there, so she left a message on the answer machine. And she left a message of love to her family. It was her final words on this earth, messages of peace and love to her family. And that message was played again and again, and it still brings tears to my eyes when I think of how helpless she must have felt, an innocent victim of 9-11. But just because a woman in the Gaza Strip doesn't carry a cell phone in her purse, or a woman in Kabul doesn't have a mobile, or a woman in Basra or Babylon or Baghdad or Chechnya or Kashmir, just because they don't have mobile phones in their purses, it doesn't make their life any less valuable. But unfortunately, in this unequal world in which we live, the life of a Westerner is worth so much more than the life of a Muslim. Muslim blood is very cheap. And where there is injustice, resistance is the only answer in any walk of life. Fortunately, in places like New Zealand, our resistance can take place by writing a letter to the newspaper, by phoning a late-night phone-in show, by signing a petition, by marching, by voting in the elections, as long as you vote for the right candidate. Doing something, reacting, it's our duty as human beings, as people who care about justice. And until there is justice in the world for everybody, there is never going to be peace, and that is the reality. About yourself and in your relationship with a god or religion, <coughs> it says in this newspaper article that you have uh, a certain amount of disorder in your life in relation to cigarettes, uh, alcohol and relationships. Uh, I just wonder why you have to embrace a religion, any religion, in order to get some sort of order back into your life. Thank you. I, I didn't. Um, when I was... Um, I worked hard and I played hard. And um, because I worked hard and I played hard, I, it had a knock-on effect and I had a disastrous private life. But that was while I was a Christian, you know, the twice a month practicing Christian. Um, I only sorted out most of those problems apart from the cigarettes when I embraced Islam and the reason, and I didn't think that that would actually happen as quickly as it did. And the reason it happened as quickly as it did 
is because if you follow Islam, your life becomes so much more simpler. All the excesses of Western living just falls away and you're left with a, a very wholesome, simple life and a, a code of um, ethics and not unlike the similar codes in Judaism and Christianity and you um, and it, it's just a, a better code for living so I you know I swapped one religion for another but I found um, the simplicity of Islam simplified my own life and um, you know my friends will tell me that I'm looking happier and healthier and more confident and more fulfilled and it's quite funny because my girlfriends still refuse to believe that it's Islam and these liberated hard drinking journalist women are saying we know why you've converted to Islam it's got to be for a man and I said no it's not <laughs> I've done it for me and it was um, one of the the best moves that um, that I made was Islam hard for you to learn Islam is uh, it's, uh, it's a challenge and each day we meet that challenge full of optimism and we try and evolve and develop and strive towards being a perfect Muslim. I am a long, long way from that but I am striving and trying every day and I will get there inshallah. So make dua for me. Thank you my girl.